it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. And um, let me just ask you the question that Anya has already asked you. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, fantastic. That's, that's great. Okay, great. So um, as Anya mentioned today, we have very strong competition on television. Um, so hopefully, you know, my webinar is going to be uh, more interesting than uh, you know, presidential debate, hopefully. Okay, so um, let's take a look at what we'll be talking about today. So the title of uh, today's session is Bits and Bobs, and we'll be looking at some interesting and challenging aspects of vocabulary and Grammar. The entire presentation is divided into two parts. The first part is uh, focused on vocabulary and uh, part two is uh, focused on grammar. But before we actually start, uh, let's have a look at the title itself, Bits and Bobs. Now, the title means, I mean, this expression from the title refers to an assortment of small items and it comes, it comes from the field of uh, carpentry and, uh, well, to be precise, uh, from a carpenter's toolbox, where bits and bobs were actually pieces of drilling equipment. So bits and bobs in modern English refers to an assortment of small, you know, different things from different kinds, etc. But originally it comes from the field of carpentry. And as I mentioned uh, at the very beginning, the first part is focused on vocabulary. False friends and confusing words, to be more precise. Now, since um, holiday uh, time is coming close, most of us uh, will be traveling to different places. Some of us will actually uh, travel by trains. And that's why the first word I wanted to uh, take a look at today is the word wagon. I mean, it looks like the Polish word wagon, but it doesn't exactly mean the same thing. Because when you use the word wagon, you might mean this or that. However, when you use the word wagon uh, wrongly, you might be actually, you might actually want to refer to something like that. So the first question to you, how would you refer to these things, in fact? And you can use your question box to type in your answers. I'm looking, uh, I'm waiting for your suggestions. Okay, I see some suggestions coming up already. All right, let's take a look at what this might be. Okay, lots of suggestions coming up. Fantastic. All right, so let's have a look at what this is. Car or carriage. Now, both words are perfectly fine. The short version is car and the longer version is carriage. Obviously, the context will make it clear because the word car might refer to a car that we, that we know, know from, uh, from the roads, for example, not necessarily from railway tracks. So context will make it clear it's a car or carriage, but there are two types of, um, of railway carriages. So let's try to guess, um, how would you refer to the one on the left and the one on the, uh, on the right? Type in your suggestions, um, you know, in the question box. The one on the left, what would you call this one? And the one on the right. Okay, two different types. I see some suggestions coming up already. Okay, so let's take a look. You have on the left, it's a passenger car. And on the right, it's a freight car. Well, basically, um, these words could be also used to refer to trains. You have passenger trains and freight trains, um, both, you know, used for different purposes. Interesting words, aren't they? Let's move on then. When you talk, uh, you know, staying still uh, within the same area of language, um, that is, you know, train journeys, uh, there might be some other words which will be quite useful. So on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, decide you have two pictures. Let's try to label them. What would you call the thing on the left and what would you call the thing on the right? And again, waiting for your suggestions. Okay, very good. I see those suggestions coming up very quickly. Okay, so let's have a look. 
it's a dining car on the left, and on the right hand side, you have a compartment. So, you know, um, a section of a car in which passengers travel. Oh, uh, right, very good. So now um, the next word is one of those words which is very confusing sometimes. The word is actual. And uh, well, this word is very often confused with the Polish word aktualny, which obviously it is not. So here's a little task for you. You have uh, two definitions. One is uh, of the word actual and the other of the word which is very often confused with, uh, with the word actual. So which definition do you think uh, is, is uh, you know, right for the word actual and what word um, matches the, the other definition? So I'm waiting for your suggestion. Number one and number two. Which one is actual? And which one is not actual? What word are we looking at? Okay, great. I see a lot of answers coming up very, very quickly. So let's have a look at the answer. So the word which is very often confused with the word actual is the word current. Um, because in Polish, we want to say that something is aktualne. In English, we can go for the word current, belonging to the present time, happening, being used or done now. Actual is existing in fact and real. So, in fact, this is visible when you take a look at these pairs of sentences, uh, because when you say them, they mean something slightly different. So, I'm busy currently is not the same as I'm busy actually, because I'm busy currently is just saying that I'm busy now at the moment. I'm busy currently, it means that, well, in fact, I am busy. It's even better visible when you take a look at the second pair of uh, expressions. Current results are the results that we have now. So imagine somebody doing research and they have current results. So you know, what they come up with uh, up to a certain point, whereas actual results would refer to the final results. So what the research actually um, shows. So this is quite a crucial difference. Now, the next word is tricky because uh, it looks and sounds strangely familiar. It's uh, the word boot. Now, um, the word boot, um, we're looking at the word as a noun, not as a verb. Uh, people are sometimes afraid of using this word because it sounds like the Polish word boot. And, uh, well, in fact, uh, it is a boot. Sometimes a boot is just a boot. Not any type of shoe uh, because it has to be some kind of shoe like that, and the definition of a boot is a sturdy item of footwear covering the foot and ankle, and sometimes also the lower leg. So it's like the word boot is quite popular in winter time uh, when your feet have to um, stay warm. All right. Another word of this sort is the word speedometer. Now, this word is tricky. Because when you take a look at the Polish word, the Polish equivalent of this word, you will see that, uh, well, the similarities are just too striking. It's speed and then O and then meter. And the Polish word is prędkość o mierz. And, uh, well, it's actually like that. So sometimes when words uh, look too similar, people are just afraid of using them. But it should not be like that. The word boots is sometimes just a boot and speedometer as well. Um, but it's not that easy, though, because there are different types of meters, and uh, the task is here for you. Try to label this, these uh, two pictures. What kind of meter do you have on the left, and what kind of the meter do you have on the right? So have a go, and use your question box to type in your suggestions. What type of meter can you see on the left? And what type of meter can you see on the right? I'll give you a hint that the one on the right has something to do with gas. OK, I see some suggestions coming up. OK, so let's have a look. I think it will be surprising to some of you to find out that on the left hand side you have a parking meter. Just notice that O is absent from um, this word. So it's, it's, as I mentioned, it's not that easy. You just cannot follow the pattern. And uh, on the right hand side, you have 
gas meter. Now, the thing is that since these words are in general, some words are kind of tricky, it's good just to double check them online just to make sure that, you know, the uh, English equivalent of the Polish word bankomat, for example, which is sometimes, you know, um, very, it's sometimes very enticing to say bankomat, but such a word does not really exist. You have a cash machine or, a, you know, ATM, for example. And here we have parking meter and gas meter. And uh, to, um, well, complicate this maybe a little bit more, we have something like this. Let's try to guess what this is. And again, use your question box to type in your suggestions. I can give you a hint that this is going to be surprising. Okay, I see some answers coming up already. All right, I, you know your answers are perfectly fine because you don't know what's inside this uh, this thing. Uh, obviously, some of you are suggesting there might be milk inside, which is true. Uh, it could be a silo, it could be a tank, but if it holds gas inside, well, surprise, surprise, it's a gasometer. So this is how sometimes words might be, you know, tricky. That's why it's also it's always a good idea just to double check a word that you that you are not sure of because it might turn out that the meaning is totally different. So a difference between uh, you no know, gasometer and gas meter with no O is uh, rather big, especially considering the size of a gasometer. Okay. Now, we're going to take a look at some even more confusing words, such as uh, this per, lie or lay. And obviously, uh, we're looking at the word lie, not in the meaning, no, not telling the truth. It's about something slightly different. And that's why here comes uh, your next task. The task is just to match the definition to these words. Number one is assume a resting position. Number two, put something down gently or carefully. Now. Which is which? Which one is lie? Which one is lay? Okay, I see some suggestions coming up very quickly. All right. Okay, so let's have a look. In number one, we have lie. In number two, we have lay. Now, the thing is that uh, well, these words kind of like, you know, more or less refer to the same thing. But lie, uh, the action of lying kind of like happens um, as if by itself. You don't need any external doer to perform the action. It's, uh, you know, a person um, or a thing that can actually uh perform this action by itself. Lay, on the other hand, re requires some kind of uh, extra activity, so somebody has to perform the action. You might want to memorize these words um, by just uh, you know, looking or listening to the way they sound. If you say lie, you have this uh, section I, and this might suggest that you can do it yourself. You don't need any extra help to perform this action. Lay, on the other hand, does not have this part, so some extra uh, person, extra thing uh, is necessary to, to perform this. And... Let's have a look at some typical word combinations with the word lie. I'm thinking of some collocations, phrases uh, in which the word lie can be used. I'll give you a hint as to what we're looking for. For example, you can lie down. Can you come up with some other combinations, uh, word combinations, collocations, phrases where the, word, where the word lie is used? And again, use your question box to type in your answers. Okay, I see some suggestions coming up. Okay, let's take a look at the selection I've prepared for you. So, we have something like lie asleep. We're actually lying, you know, asleep. Uh, this is, you know, this is the word you might want to, uh, the, that you might want to combine with, um, with uh, the word asleep. 
Now, the next one is lie awake. So actually, when you are having problems falling asleep, uh, you might be lying awake. Now, the next one is just to lie flat. I guess it's self-explanatory, so just lying flat on the floor or on the bed, for example. You can lie still, so actually uh, not really moving. And finally, lie sprawled. Now, this uh, type of lying is with your arms and legs extended in all directions, lying sprawled on the sofa, watching TV, watching a movie. But basically, uh, you know, quite uh, lying down quite uh, comfortably. All uh, right, let's move on then to the next word, which is lay. And the task is the same. So let's take a look at uh, some typical combinations here. What type of uh, collocations you might come up with. So here's a hint for you again. You can lay the table. In a moment, I'll tell you what laying the table means. All right. Waiting for your suggestions. You can uh, you know, use the question box to type them in. All right, I see. Very good. What other combinations can you come up with? All right. Very good. So let's have a let's have a look at what I've prepared for you. Laying the table, as some of you have rightly suggested, is the same as setting the table. So what you actually do, you're preparing the table um, for eating. So, you know, all the plates, all the cutlery is on the table. Now, what else? You can lay tiles. If you're considering uh, redecorating your bathroom, for example, you might think of uh, you know, different tiles uh, for the floor, different tiles uh, for your walls, etc. So, you know, laying tiles uh, is this. Now, you can lay books on the table, and for that matter, you can lay anything on anything. You can, you know, lay uh, a computer on the on the table or on the bed, etc. So basically, you know, it refers to an action of just putting things gently on some other things. Lay the foundations for. Now, this is uh, quite cool. Uh, you might imagine some scientist uh, coming up with a theory on how to uh, travel between different stars, so how to perform interstellar travels. And uh, these would be the found. You know, the theory would be the foundation for um, for you know, space travel. So the scientist uh, lays the foundation for it. And finally, lay eggs. Uh, this is a down-to-earth activity thanks to chickens or hens actually performing this action. We can have scrambled egg for breakfast. Uh, right. Now, the thing gets a little bit more confusing when you take a look at the forms of these words. Uh, so, you know, these words uh, have one thing in common, uh, namely that past simple of the word lie is lay. And, uh, well, also lay is a little bit less irregular, if you like. Because, you know, if you remember the word lay, and then it goes like laid, laid, then it's much easier to memorize the word lie because past simple is just lay, and you only have to memorize uh, past participle as lane. Ah, pretty confusing, but uh, it's possible to memorize if you see some um, uh, similarities between these two words. All right. Now, um, the next pair of words, uh, which we're going to take a look at, are these two, rise and raise. Just notice that they sound quite similar to the previous set of words. Rise, raise. So the task for you is to take a look at these two definitions and decide which is which. Which one is rise? Which one is raise? So move from a lower position to a higher position and lift to a higher position or level. Number one, rise or raise. Number two, rise or raise. OK, I see some answers coming up already. Very good. And my hint is just to notice the similarity between this pair of words and the other pair of words. If you see the similarity in uh, how they sound, it might be easier to come up with the correct answer. And the correct answer is 
rise is number one, so move from a low position to a higher one, and raise is number two, lift to a high position or level. Now, the thing is, uh, you know, again, rise doesn't require any external doer. The action can be performed by you yourself, so you don't need any help. So just moving from a low position to a higher position, raising, on the other hand, is more about lifting. So somebody has to do it, in fact. So rise and raise. And again, we're going to take a look at some typical word combinations uh, with the word rise. And my hint is um, rise, sun rises. It just happens. Nobody has to raise it, in fact. So uh, can you think of other phrases in which the word rise is used? And again, use your question box to type in your suggestions. Very good. OK, great. So how about taking a look at what I have prepared for you? So we have uh, sun rising in the east, and we have also such expression, rise and shine. This is what you can say to people um, when you want to wake them up. It's kind of like, you know, you can walk around the room shouting, rise and shine, rise and shine, everybody. Um, just, you know, uh, it's kind of like a typical phrase that you use when you wake people up and want them to feel happy about, about this. Okay, rise above it or rise above something is also an interesting phrase. It means to ignore difficulties um, along the way. So, for example, if you're setting up a business and you're having some initial you know, problems uh, with, I don't know, bureaucracy, for example, you might just rise above it, rise above your problems and move on. So if you rise above something, you ignore those small things and just move on because you know that you are after something bigger. Now, rise just to say stand up. This is something uh, if you're watching TV, uh, you might just come across this word in uh, you know, TV series where there is a courtroom, the judge enters the courtroom, and then people are asked to rise, just to stand up. Rising from the dead is also possible, zombie movies. And prices rise themselves, actually just, you know, it just happens. Now, the last phrase, pay rise, is in fact a noun phrase, because rise here is a noun, not so much a verb, and it kind of like, you know, happens by itself. So um, pay rise, prices rise, pay rise, these two should be interconnected. Okay, let's take a look at the other word of the pub, which was raise. And again, let's take a look at some typical word combinations here. Raise, and my hint is raise your hand. So if you want to say something. All right, and again, use a question box to type in your answers. Okay, I see some answers coming up already. What else can you raise? Okay, let's take a look at what we have here. You can raise your child. Here, the usage is a bit more metaphorical because uh, it doesn't mean lifting your child up. It means to bring up your child from, you know, the little baby to a grown-up uh, adult. Now, you can raise your voice. It just means to speak a bit louder. You can raise your eyebrows if you're surprised at something. And finally, you can get a pay raise. So the funny thing is that uh, if you remember, you know, the phrases from the previous word, uh, it was pay rise as well. Now, if you do a little online research, you'll find out that actually both forms are possible. It could be pay rise or it could be pay raise. Both are perfectly understandable. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, uh, it just happens itself or there might be some people responsible for that. OK, another pair I would like to draw your attention to is this advice or advice. 
Sometimes people tend to think that this is the difference between American English and British English, and to some extent it is, but we are not looking into such differences. We focus on British English exclusively. So in this particular case, uh, the difference is between the form of the verb. Depending on which letter you decide to put, you are no, uh, you are either using a noun or a verb. And the task for you is to take a look at these two sentences and decide in which one we should put C and in which one we should put an S. So have a go at this. Use your question box to suggest the answers. Fantastic. All right. Very good. I see a lot of answers coming up. So let's take a look at the answers here. In number one, what we want to use is a noun, and that's why we go for a C. So your advice was priceless. Remember, advice with a C is a noun. And he advised me to stay home. You put an S because this is a verb. So it might look like a tiny typo, but in fact, uh, it's not just a typo, it's the difference between noun and a verb, and noun is with a C, the verb is with an S. Okay, now, another word which is very often confused is the word actually. Now, um, oh, sorry, the word eventually. Now, the word eventually uh, does not mean eventualnie. So if it does not mean eventualnie, what does it mean then? Type in your suggestions in the question box. I see some suggestions coming up already. Fantastic. That's great. And you're suggesting some other English words which might be used um, in the place of eventually, which is a very good thing. OK. Great. So let's take a look actually is the same as finally or in the end. So the word finally and the phrase in the end mean um, exactly the same thing, which is not eventual. So let's take a look at these two sentences, a short exercise here. Take a look at these green sections of the sentences. Uh, in the first one, fill in the blank space with the word, which would make sense in this particular case. And in number two, try to come up with a replacement for the Polish phrase lub ewentualnie in this particular sentence. So waiting for your suggestions and use your question box to type them in. OK, very good. Good. Let's take a look at what we have here. So in number one, we have worked hard and eventually we achieved a goal. And obviously, uh, the other two phrases I've suggested would make just as much sense here. So and in the end, we achieved um, our goal. And finally, we achieved a goal. Now, in number two, you can go for the simple or. We can go to the cinema or watch a movie at home. If you want to add something, you can go for a word such as, you know, this one alternatively. But really, sometimes it's just good to keep things uh, nice and simple and all will just do the job perfectly fine. Now, we've spoken uh, about the word eventually and we said that uh, it's the same as in the end. So how about taking a look at these two phrases? in the end versus at the end, because they both mean something slightly different. But I think that since we have covered the word eventually, this exercise will be really uh, easy for you. The task is just to match the definition to the word. So which one is in the end, which one is at the end? And again, use your question box to type in your answers. Very good. As I mentioned, this one is definitely going to be very, very easy because now you know that in the end is finally or after a long time. So the other one must be at the end and usually of something. And this at the end is used literally to refer to the end of a specific noun. This noun could be a physical object, a period of time, an event 
or a place. So how about taking a look at these sentences and deciding where you can put in and where you could put at. So take a look at these sentences and again, type in your suggestions in the question box. Very good. Some of you are doing this one by one. Some of you are just giving all the answers in one go. That's great. Cool. So let's take a look at what we have here. So in sentence one, we have, we worked hard and in the end we achieved a goal. So this, uh, you know, looks familiar because we've already covered a sentence like that. Uh, number two, I pay the phone bill at the end of each month. Just notice that we have you know, a period of time and then at the end of this period, uh, we do something. In three, in the end, what really matters in a friendship is trust. So, you know, finally, this is what, what matters. And the last sentence, there is a big building at the end of the road. This is quite similar to number two, which is uh, talking, uh, you know, about a physical road place at the end of which there is something. And in fact, this is the end of the first section. And we're moving on to section two, which is about tricky grammar. And the first word we're going to take a look at is the word whose. And there are a lot of misconceptions about the word whose. That's why we'll just try to get rid of these misconceptions. And let's take a look at these two sentences. So the task for you is, well, obviously to fill in the blank spaces with a single word, which could, you know, which makes sense. So one word in each gap. How would you complete these sentences? Use your question box to type in your answers. Okay, great. I see some answers coming up already. And, and we'll see in a moment. Okay, a couple of more seconds. And let's have a look. This might be, uh, well, this hopefully will be surprising to some of you at least, because in both cases, you might use whose. So sentence one goes something like, my brother whose car was stolen has bought a new one. And the other one goes something like, the house whose roof you can see over there belongs to my uncle. Now, the thing is that the word whose very often people think can only be used with, uh, with people. But it's not true. You can use it with animals. You can use it with uh, physical objects such as house, because, you know, another expression could, which could be used in the place of whose is the roof of which. If you want to keep it simple, you just go for whose. You could say something like a car whose wheel is missing. You can use say something like, um, I don't know, uh, a dog whose owner is um, at the store or something. Basically, animals and objects can also take whose, so don't be afraid of using this. Ha! All right, let's move on. The next section in grammar is devoted to commas. Now, English is rather lenient as far as those rules regarding commas are concerned, and that's why sometimes people tend to copy the rules from the Polish language and use them in the English language, which sometimes makes sense and sometimes does not. We'll obviously take a look at, uh, at some examples to see which things make sense and which things uh, don't. So the task for you is to decide which sentence is correct. Is it number one or is it number two? Okay, a lot of answers coming up. All right, so let's have a look at the correct version of these sentences. Ha! Number one is incorrect. Number two is correct. It's um, common in Polish language to put comma in front of że. In English, such rule does not really exist. So he told me that, and then you quote somebody's words, uh, doesn't require you to use any comma. So no comma here 
the set the sentence that two is the correct version so you know much fewer commas in the uh, many fewer commas in the english language all right let's move on we have uh, these two sentences, and the task for you is, first off, to read them and then decide where you would put a comma. You don't have to retype the entire sentence, just, you know, the section, uh, you know, the word uh, and the comma will do perfectly fine. So take a look at these sentences and type in your answers in the question box. One of these sentences might look familiar. In fact, both of them might look familiar. All right, so let's have a look. I see a lot of suggestions coming up, really. All right, so my brother, comma, whose car was stolen, has bought a new one. This is one sentence. The other one is, the house whose roof you can see over there belongs to my uncle. Now, in sentence one, you use commas between, because this is uh, this shows where you put additional information, something which is not really necessary to understand the sentence. Um, it's just something extra. You know, if you communicate to somebody that your brother has bought a new car, this is a perfectly you know, valid uh, information. And uh, whose car was stolen, this is something extra. Now, when you say the house, the roof you see, uh, you can see over there belongs to my uncle, if you just say the house, uh, the person to whom you are talking might not be really, uh, you know, might not really understand what house you're talking about. So if you if you're adding necessary bit of information, you don't put commas, and if you add some extra information, you take this, uh, you, you put this bit in commas, and then everything is clear that you know this is something extra. It's not like uh, it's not like something without which the sentence would not be understandable. Even the intonation is slightly different because you go something like, my brother, whose car was stolen, has bought a new car, and this is it. Now, let's move on to another sentence. We have something like that, and the task is quite similar, to put commas where you think they should go. And again, you don't need to retype the entire sentence, just the bits with the commas. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Now, um, Jack White is a name and a surname, so you, you can keep this together. All right, let's take a look at what we have here. So this is uh, this sentence goes something like I saw Jack White, comma Madonna, comma and her daughter. But this sentence is tricky, especially this little comma here, because it's a so-called Oxford comma, which uh, well is subject to a lot of debates online. And this is why, because you have an option. I mean, this comma can be used, but it doesn't have to. But there is you know some difference in meaning. So let's take a look. Now, sometimes they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, and that's why the meaning of these two sentences will be illustrated with the different pictures. So here we go. If you put a comma between Madonna and her daughter, you mean something like that. If you don't, you mean something like that. Now, this is quite interesting when you consider, for example, working on projects and people working in different teams. If you want to indicate who worked alone and who you know, which people formed a team, you might consider using or not using commas to indicate how these people were working, for example. So Madonna and her daughter with no commas suggests that these two were together at one location at the same time. Nice, isn't it? Let's move on to something that all of us really love, and uh, these are articles. And we'll start with a sentence like this. I don't have pen. So let's admit it. If you say something like this, it's a perfectly understandable sentence. It's grammatically incorrect, but it's understandable. However, you know, articles are important. They are not 
equally important all the time. Sometimes they are more important, sometimes they are not as important. And we're going to take a look at uh, you know, situations when using or not using articles makes quite a lot of difference. For example, we have such words, little and few. Little, obviously, refers to uncountable nouns, and few refers to countable nouns. And this is a negative piece of information, so yeah, little, few, not good, for some reason. But if you put a in front of these words, and you come up with a little and a few, information changes, and it turns into positive information. So here's a little task for you. Take a look at these sentences and decide when the article should actually be added just for these sentences uh, to make sense. And I'm waiting for your suggestions. Use the question box to type in your answers. Okay, great. So, right, let's have a look at what we have here. So, in number one, you have, yes, I can help you. I have a little experience in this. If you can help somebody and then you just you know, drop the article, it's kind of like a uh, you know, ambiguous piece of information. Why should you help if you have little experience? A little makes much more sense. Help yourself to some tea. We have a few kinds to choose from. Obviously, this makes sense because, um, well, if you have a few kinds to choose from, then it would be difficult to select the kind of tea that you really like. In three, in fact, both options are possible depending on what you want to communicate. If you want to say that there are not too many places and it might be difficult to find such places, you will just go for few. So there are few places where this can be done. However, if the number of these places is not like huge, but it's not problematic to find one of those, you can go for a few. So, well, um, there are a few places where this can be done. And finally, uh, if you don't want to give sugar to somebody because you have a little, the message is kind of confusing because uh, little makes sense here. It's you know, a negative piece of information. That's why you don't want to give sugar to somebody. And moving on with the articles, we have something like this, in the hospital. And to illustrate the two different meanings of, uh, you know, of the phrase, depending on whether or not you use articles, take a look at these two situations. And you have a situation on the left and the situation on the right. Just type in your question box uh, whether or not you actually need the in those cases on the left hand side. Do you need the? Don't you need the? On the right hand side, would you actually put the or not really? Oh, right, I see some answers. So on the left, is it in hospital, in the hospital? On the right, is it in the hospital or just in hospital? Uh, right, so let's take a look at the correct version and ta-da, there we go. In hospital, you drop the article when you go to a place um, to use it for the purpose for which it was it was built. So in hospital, you go to hospital as a patient. You go to a hospital or to the hospital, for example, as a visitor, just to have a meeting. And, uh, well, hospital is not the only word which functions like this, because there are some other words which function more or less in the same way. So hospital as a patient with uh, no article, and the a hospital as a building. School, you go to school as a student, but the school, a school, a building, maybe you're just a parent uh, and you're actually going to take your child from school. Church, if you go to church uh, to participate in a mass, you just go to church, the church, a church, well, this is a tourist attraction as well. And the same applies to different means of transportation, buses, trains, as a passenger, you drop articles, but if you're just referring to the vehicles, uh, you use a or the. So 
How about taking a look at these four sentences and deciding whether or not we actually need an article here? So take a look at these blank spaces and either type in um, an article or just leave it blank. So have a go at these sentences and use your question box to type in your answers. Great. All right, I see a lot of answers coming very, very quickly. Let's have a look. So she wants to go to university. Possibly, you know, we would use such a phrase when we want to say that she wants to study at this particular university. If you come out of hospital after six weeks, uh, you must have been a patient at that particular hospital. If you come somewhere, go somewhere by bus, uh, you are referring to the bus from the point of view of a passenger. And the final sentence, I'm out of the office today, is really interesting because it's one of those uh, sentences which is used very, very often in those automatic replies when you're not available on a given day. Sometimes people drop them from, from the messages. And let's have a look at this set of sentences to see what the meaning, uh, what, what the differences in meaning uh, is. So I'm out of the office today. This is something that we've already taken a look at. In the next sentence, you have Barack Obama is now in office and George W. Bush is out of office. So just notice the difference, how the meaning changes if you use an article or if you don't use it. OK, so we're done with the articles and moving on to tenses, past simple versus present perfect. Now, um, very often these tenses are confusing because there are you know, quite a lot of differences between them. But you can keep those differences, uh, you know, quite simple and focus on some basic aspects. So whenever you ask a question when something happened and you know exactly when something happened, which tense would you go for? Use your question box to type in your answer. Would you use past simple or would you use present perfect when you know when something happened? All right, very good. OK, so let's take a look. When you know when something happened, you go for past simple. And in fact, there are some phrases which tell you when something happened. For example, yesterday, a second ago, last week, or from Friday to Sunday. All these phrases I know perfectly um, clear because uh, you, you know when the action happened. Take a look at this one a second ago. It doesn't have to be you know, a long time ago, but since you know that it happened you know, a second ago, two seconds ago, 10 minutes ago, it's still past simple. So obviously, um, when you're not interested when something happened, but you're interested in what happened, you would go for the other tense. And this other tense is obviously present perfect. Now, if you're not interested in the time of the action, you are not interested in time expressions. So in sentences with uh, present perfect, there would be no time expressions, for example. There would be expressions such as recently or lately, which are very, very um, vague because you don't know. Recently could be like, you no, know, 10 minutes ago. It could be two days ago. It could be last week. It's very relative. So we don't know when exactly something happened. So basic difference when you know when something happened, past simple. If you're not interested when something happened, you're interested in what happened, you go for present perfect. And let's take a look at these sentences to see which ones would be used with uh, you know, present perfect and which ones would rather use past simple. OK, very good. All right, so let's have a go. Should be easy at this point. And we have the first one. I saw him two minutes ago. Well, two minutes ago, past simple. 
I have read this book. We don't know when we know what happened, so it must be present perfect. Sentence three, I didn't see Jane last week. Again, last week, we know exactly when the thing happened, so we go to past simple. And finally, I have spoken with him recently. Recently, well, we don't know exactly when, so we go for present perfect. And um, the final section of today's webinar is about troublesome numbers. So let's have a look at two in, you know, two types of numbers. These are one, two, three, and the first, the second, and the third. Now, the first type of numbers is called cardinal numbers. So these are the those more important numbers. And the second type of numbers is called ordinal numbers because they refer to the order of things. And sometimes it's confusing uh, when to use one, when to use the first, and three, the third. So let's have a look. We'll take a look at number 22. So it's the first type of number. It's the so-called cardinal number. Now, let's try to think of some typical combinations where we could use this number. And my suggestion is page, like page 22. What else can be used with number 22 rather than 22nd? Okay, degrees when you're talking about temperature. Very good. Hours, five o'clock. That's right. Okay, so let's take a look at the um, suggestions I, I prepared for you here. So chapter 22 and paragraph 22 and gate 22 as well. And house number. You can say, you know, um, something something street 22. So basically, these things just go with um, order with cardinal numbers, uh, right? And you know, it's easy to nav navigate um, through your textbooks, for example. You just say, well, page twenty-two, chapter five, etc. Twenty-second, uh, twenty-second. So, what about this? What combinations can we have with this? My suggestion is, whoa, two suggestions. <laughs> so, twenty-second place. 22nd floor. All right, and one more, the 22nd of May. So uh, obviously we're talking about, uh, we're talking about streets, uh, not streets, but dates as well. And 20, 22nd street as well. Some of you suggest street in fact. Okay, now numbers might be also quite uh, interesting when you look at um, such situations. So you have a bottle which holds two liters, you have a car which is five years old, and you have a building which has ten stories. So in order to make these uh, a little bit you know, less complicated and shorter, what you can do is to go for something like this. A two-liter bo two bottle, a five-year-old car, and a ten-story building. Just notice how these are structured. You put a number, you put a hyphen, and then you put um, the word in singular. So it's a two-liter bottle, it's a five-year-old car, and it's a ten-story building. So it goes like this. So a final task for you is to take a look at these sentences here and try to think of some expressions with numbers which could work in these sentences. Let's have a go at this. All right, I see some answers coming up already. Well, quite a lot of these answers, really. Okay. I think you've already managed to uh, to answer all of these. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at this. So a marathon is a 42 kilometer race. Just notice the number, hyphen, and then kilometer. Not kilometers, just kilometer. And then it's in this book. Page 24, paragraph 5. So, you know, it's not like page 22nd, uh, the fifth paragraph, paragraph 5. As easy as this. In 3, 
you can leave your car there. There's a multi-story car park. So if we don't know how many stories uh, there are, we can just go for multi, multi-story. And just notice that story is uh, singular. And the address, 10 Downing Street, not 10th or anything like that. And the last one, my office is on the third floor, the second door on the left. So here, this one is a little bit more complicated, but this is what it should sound like. Okay, and in fact, this is uh, everything that I prepared for you today, guys. Thanks, thanks a lot. Now, um, Anya will tell you something about uh, what you can also do at Worldwide School as well. And if you have any questions to me, it's time for you to ask these questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. So over to Anya. And I'll be back in a moment to answer your questions. Dziękuję Maćku za poprowadzenie tego webinarium. Państwu bardzo dziękuję za aktywny udział. Widzę wiele odpowiedzi się tutaj pojawiało. Proszę o wpisywanie pytań do Maćka, na pewno zaraz na nie odpowie. A w międzyczasie, gdy Państwo będą pisać, ja chciałam powiedzieć dwa słowa o tym. Jednej z rzeczy, którą jeszcze, które jeszcze mamy w naszej ofercie, są to między innymi audyty i testy językowe dla firm. Robimy takie testy własne na zamówienie, mamy także różnego rodzaju gotowe testy online i papierowe, a także przeprowadzamy takie egzaminy certyfikowane BULAC, o których za chwilę. Robimy różnego rodzaju testy, to są czy testy rekrutacyjne, czy takie szybkie testy poziomujące, grupujące słuchaczy na przykład na, na poziom zaawansowania do szkolenia, ale także audyty kompetencyjne, które, które koncentrują się już na umiejętnościach koniecznych na danym stanowisku, czy specjalistyczne audyty z danej branży. I organizacyjnie tutaj jesteśmy bardzo elastyczni, są to y, robimy i testy na papierze, i online, ustnym w siedzibie klienta i telefonicznie z zakresu czy języka i ogólnego, i biznesowego, i branżowego. No ale teraz jeszcze dwa słowa o tym egzaminie BULAC, o którym mówiłam na początku. Gdyby ktoś z Państwa potrzebował takiego egzaminu zewnętrznego, zupełnie niezależnego od danego dostawcy, to oferujemy tutaj egzamin BULAC, który może być także realizowany albo na papierze, albo online. Jest dostępny w czterech językach, daje międzynarodowy certyfikat i jest też dostosowany właśnie do mierzenia poziomu zaawansowania języka w takim środowisku zawodowym. Gdyby ktoś z Państwa miał jakieś pytania odnośnie tej naszej oferty, to zapraszam do kontaktu tutaj pod podanym e-mailem, który Państwo widzicie, albo e-mailem podanym przy rejestracji na webinaria. Zapraszam serdecznie. A teraz już oddaję głos Maćkowi, który odpowie na pytania. Hello, I'm back here. So um, there is one very interesting question uh, one of you asked, and the question refers back to the description of today's webinar. The question was about the difference between an offer and business proposal. So basically, the difference is, uh, well, not so much in what it means to, but in the form of uh, what it looks like. So you go to an online store and you have, um, you, have a, you, know, you can click on an offer and you have you know, the entire assortment of things that a given store uh, has an offer. So this is an offer. Now, business proposal is something that you send to a prospective client of yours when they send you first a request for information. So, um, you know, um, it's not like you're sending an offer. It's uh, more complex, more detailed, etc. So this is a business proposal and an offer is just a simple uh, presentation of what a given company or what a given store has uh, for you to buy. So that would be the difference. Thanks a lot, guys, for joining me uh, tonight. Hopefully, uh, what you have learned today will be useful for you in your daily usage of the English language. And uh, well, join us for next for some you know, next webinar. Thanks a lot and good night. Ja także Państwu jeszcze raz dziękuję. Zapraszam do wypełnienia ankiety, która pokaże się po zamknięciu webinarium i przypominam, że materiały i nagranie zostanie do Państwa wysłane w przyszłym tygodniu. I zapraszam serdecznie na nasze kolejne webinaria, o których będzie.